From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. A New York Times column I did recently happily put me back in touch with today's guest, organic farmer Kate Spring, who in our past conversations has always taught me how to think smarter about when to start seeds, like how to time succession sowings of vegetables for an extended harvest well into fall. This time she gave me a 101 on another kind of seed sowing, but indoors, preferably under lights and starting right now as winter descends. Today's topic is mastering microgreens. But first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. Kate Spring and her husband, Edge Fuentes, founded Good Heart Farmstead in Vermont in 2013, which serves up to 100 customers each season who subscribe to their CSA share program. Their organic farming business is kind of a hybrid business structure called an L3C, a low-profit, limited liability company, where part of the mission is to support Vermonters in need of food access. Kate's also a writer and the only person I know with her very own brand new yurt, which I can't wait to hear about, having seen it be constructed on Instagram. So welcome back, Miss Yurt Owning. Kate, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing really well and very excited about the yurt, too. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> it's beyond cool. Like, And you guys built it. I was just so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we actually used to live in a yurt a little bit bigger than the one I posted about on Instagram. So this year is going to be my own office so I can close the door and um, hopefully not be interrupted <laughs> during this winter's homeschooling and um, have, have my own creative space. So I'm excited about it. Cool. I see you're doing lots of interesting things, like you're facilitating workshops for farmers who are also, like you are, speaking of interruptions, parenting and homeschooling young children. You're facilitating workshops with uh, Northeast Farm Access of Vermont. Is that right? Is that what I'm... Uh, yeah, no. the the Northeast um, Farming Association. Association, yeah, so right, right, right. There's okay. been such a big, um, you know, need for support for farming parents, especially this year with the pandemic. So yes. um, we have put together a series of conversations um, for folks to join in virtually, uh, which one benefit of the pandemic is that in our first farming parenting uh, forum session, we had folks tuning in from uh, Canada and Massachusetts. And so it's opened up like a wider community where we can get together and talk and, and listen and give each other support and tools as we run businesses and, and have kids during the pandemic. And some of those kids are home this year and some are doing flex schools and some are still really little. <laughs> so it's, yes. um, yeah, it's yes. been, been good, good to connect. Well, so microgreens. <clears throat> for the first time I read up on them was a few years back. I think you were working for High Mowing Organic Seeds at the time and wrote a complete how-to on their blog, which is why dot, dot, dot years later when I was going to do the New York Times story, I thought of you and called you. So before we get into the process, can we just identify what's a microgreen? Because it was very interesting for me in the comment section at the on the Times story. A lot of people were like, why did you put them in pot, in um, germinating mix and seed starting soil? Why didn't you just do them in water? Like they didn't know the difference between a sprout and a microgreen, um, you know, uh, it, it, you know, and then there are shoots and, you know, uh, the same plant can be grown 
to many stages of its life by different methods. So can we kind of say what's a microgreen together? Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's a really important distinction because um, with a sh- with a uh, sprout, you don't need any growing medium. It's really just wetting the seed, and you can do it in a mason jar at home. Um, all of this you can do at home. But with a sprout, you're also eating the seed, uh, whereas with a microgreen, you're growing it in uh, soil, in a growing medium, and you're growing it just uh, past the point of the where the cotyledons have uh, opened up, and then you get the first true leaf, and that that can take anywhere between you know ten days to twenty five days, depending on the crop. And when you harvest, you're harvesting the stems and the leaves, so you're not eating the seeds, um, unlike with sprouts. Right, so the it's, root it's as a, well. You're, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So it's just yeah. um, the stage beyond the sprout. Right, exactly. And, and um, yeah, so both are possible, but they're different. The nutritive, the, the nutritional value is different. What you're getting, as you said, like with the sprouts, you're getting the root and the seed that's been that's opened up and germinated. But, um, you know, you're not cutting that off, but you're not getting as much green, typically. They're... Right. I mean, you're not getting those right. true leaves. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it was very interesting to read um, a report, and I think it was done in two, 2012, I believe, uh, evaluating the microgreen forms of certain crops relative to the mature leaf forms of those crops and how nutrient dense these little. Mm-hmm first true leaves were from four to 40 times as much nutrition per volume, you know, as their mature counterpart, um, depending on the crop. So very, very interesting. So, right. And I think with microgreens, I think you can really taste that too, because the flavor is really potent. And so, um, for with basil, for example, which we talked about basil for the New York times piece, and we just did, uh, basil harvest for our last BSA delivery of the season. And um, when you're harvesting them and when you're eating them, it's just so the the flavor and the smell is so potent. Um, It's really delicious and delightful. (laughs) So yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's just like a stronger flavor all around. So speaking of what you're growing, um, and 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 I I I should have said at the beginning, thank you for making time to talk today because I know I think this is your only month of the year that you're have you have <laughs> quote downtime, which I know on a farm is never really downtime, but you're not you're not ship you're not uh, preparing CSA shares for people to to deliver or pick up this week and then for the next few weeks you have a month off quote unquote <laughs> off yeah yeah. That's right. It's nice. We've uh, built that into our year. And, um, and as you said, there's also plenty of other things going on. So it's really nice to, to sit down and talk rather than, you know, doing all the extra cleanup that inevitably still gets piled up outside. Yeah. So you just mentioned basil. Now that would be if we bought basil in the store in the off season, it, we would might find it as a, um, you know, a, a whole uh, stem, you know, a more mature thing that was, you know, maybe bagged or in a clamshell plastic box or whatever. And it could be quite expensive relative to what you're getting. And um, with some of the microgreens, you might find them in a clamshell or a plastic bag or whatever. They're super expensive. And again, especially in the off season, they're super expensive. These are not a, mm-hmm. um, a cheap crop if you buy it finished, right? I mean, it's a premium item. Yes. That's right. And um, so you'll typically, at least around here, you'll see it being sold by the ounce. So it might be like two or three dollars an ounce. But when you compare that in pound price, you know, it can be anywhere from like thirty six to forty eight dollars per pound. So it's a lot more expensive to buy compared to a salad mix. Um, But it's also really easy to grow. So it's it's one of those things that um, it's, you know, it's a great thing to do at home if you don't want to, uh, you know, 
be buying it every single week. And for farmers, it is also a great thing to add into um, into CSA shares or farm stands, things like that. Right. So, um, so we could grow. We could choose to grow herbs, a few different herbs, which I think you grow some. You just mentioned one. We could grow certain greens. We could grow some of the root crops as microgreens. What are some of the ones, maybe besides basil, that you um, you grow pretty regularly, or that we should start? We should think about starting with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Along with basil, uh, we grow cilantro. Those are the two herbs that we focus on. And then we also really love kale, arugula, mizuna, broccoli, um, radishes. Those are the, the, one, the ones I just mentioned are in the faster to grow uh, category. So those ones can be ready in 10 to 15 days. So those are nice to start out with because you okay. get to harvest a lot faster and um yeah they're all they're all delicious and by themselves but you can also mix them all together too and now in a little bit counterintuitively we're not growing salad like we're not growing microgreen lettuce (laughs) like we're not right this isn't the instead of baby leaf lettuce or you know what I mean we're not trying to fill the whole salad bowl with microgreens are we and and actually you didn't mention lettuce and I don't think you grow lettuce as a microgreen is that correct we don't grow lettuce as microgreen we do have some lettuce that we overwinter in our greenhouse um but you're right so we use this more as a something to add to uh you can add it to your baby leaf salad or you can add it on top of um, tacos or eggs or uh, into pasta sauce. It's really something that we use as an ingredient for right. um, for the meal rather than like the main meal. So the basic 101, so I know I, I have to probably get a lights of some kind because the windowsill, it'll work, but they're going to be a little weaker, I think, unless you have an incredible windowsill, which I don't yeah. in the north. Um, um, <laughs> and so I'm going to use my seed starting light, which, you know, I can fit it on a particular part of my kitchen counter or somewhere else like that. Um, what do I want? Like a room <laughs> that's around 60 something degrees, like not hot, not cold. Is that the idea? Right. Yeah. I think, you know, like 65 to 70 degrees is the mm-hmm. ideal range. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and so I'm going to get out my light and I'm going to get a seed tray. So tell me kind of like, what's the basic 101? Mm-hmm. So we, you can do two different, two different ways. So one is Using a tray that has, um, starting starting with like a general 10 by 20 tray, and we use trays that have um, drainage holes in them because we bottom water once the seeds have emerged, and that's mainly because the microgreens tend to be very delicate, so it's easy for them to get, you know, fallen over if you're watering them with, uh, if you don't have a mister or a spray bottle. Um right. So if you if you want to bottom water, make sure that you have a tray that has drainage holes. Otherwise, you can get you know a regular whatever tray that you typically or flat that you typically start your seeds in, and um, then you're gonna use like about one inch of potting soil and scatter the seeds pretty thickly on the soil, and that is you basically want to see you do want to see the soil, but what what we've read up on and have done is about 10 to 20 seeds, or sorry, 10 to 12 seeds per inch. Um, and this is the part where you really can put on your trial mindset and it doesn't have to be perfect. You're just going to um, get more used to it and more comfortable the more you grow microgreens. Um, and from there, you... You just keep them moist, and they'll um, emerge within usually three to five days. And then from there, you're going to just keep them watered either with a misting uh, nozzle or, again, with, like, a a spray bottle. Um, Or you can bottom water with a tray underneath. Right. So so when we say per inch, so the tiny seeds... 
we might be on that upper end, like 10 per square inch or whatever. And it's sort of a square inch. If you, I, I loved seeing some of the pictures in your greenhouse of some of the trays. It's almost like you had, like, maybe you did have like a dibber or some kind of a, um, something that made almost like a grid of little recesses, a little as if I'd poked my finger on a perfect grid throughout the tray and into each yeah. one of those things an inch apart in each direction. So in a, within a square inch, you put a little group of seeds and, and that made the spacing perfect. Um, we don't have to be totally obsessed, but like you said, you have your trial mind on, be open to observing your first time. Was it too thick? Was it too thin? Was it too sparse? What didn't work, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so yeah. And the watering too, it's, um, yeah. So ha having, I, I think the bottom watering, you put like a quarter of an inch of water in the bottom once they're up so that you don't smash them down or otherwise I love that, um, hand pump. Um, it's like a, a, pre a vacuum pressure. Uh, it's an expensive yeah. thing from solo, you know, and you like pump it a few times and then you just, um, the trigger, you just spray and you can miss a whole tray. But anything stronger than that, boy, they do get flattened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> and yes, we when we started out growing microgreens, we did scatter it and then scatter the seeds on the soil when we were sowing them. And we have switched to a using a seeding plate that that we have that just as you said creates a perfect grid. And then we put multiple seeds within each uh, little dibble hole. But again, it's you don't have to do that. That's just more of our efficiencies as a farm and, and growing for many um, CSA shares. But if, again, if you're growing for yourself, you can you can just test it out and try different thicknesses and um, and have fun with it. Yeah. So so let's say I wanted to have, and I remember you told me you. Uh, put the cilantro microgreens on top of like black bean and sweet potato tacos, which sounded so amazing. And mm -hmm. that, just imagining that flavor, like in February, you know, to have that flavor would be so great. Um, and the basil, of course, I can imagine a lot of things I'd love to put that on top of. Um, but I don't need, if I'm a one or two or smaller household, I don't need a whole tray of each one. Can I do partial trays? And do I sew it all at this? I assume I have to sew it all at the same time because like when you were just talking about they might germinate in three to five days, then the lid needs to come off the, um, I guess we should have said either, you know, might, you might use one of those humidity domes or you might just mm -hmm. use a piece of moist toweling, like a um, paper towel to keep the seeds right. moist before they germinate. And then you remove that, either the lid or the towel. And when they sprout, they have to go under the light. They don't go under the light till they sprout, but once they do, they need to, Right. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And um, and you can definitely sow different varieties within the same tray. Um, and when you do that, you just want to pay attention to the days to maturity. So if you want to have maybe two or three different herbs in one tray, you would just want to pick varieties that are going to be germinating and at harvest in this generally the same time frame and that way you can treat the tray in a uniform way right. and um you could also do you know seed partial trays if you want to um i the thing about microgreens is you're gonna you can eat a whole tray pretty quickly even though the, <laughs> you know <laughs> it, it can seem like a lot but then they're so good and and they don't take up too much space um but yeah, it'd be, uh, it's, it's really fun to mix and match different varieties together. And then you can, um, you know, kind of create your own mixes. Or if you want to try a pre-made mix, there are some great pre-made mixes, too, that you can get from High Mowing or Johnny's or, uh, you know, different seed companies. Yeah, and I think both high mowing and Johnny's, to figure out, like, which ones or what days to maturity and how long to germinate and so forth, they tend to have a lot of, because they both sell to farmers, they have a lot of mm -hmm. like technical information, growing information, you know, a lot of details. So if you want to make good matches, which is quick, which is slow, which would be good mm -hmm. in a mixed tray or whatever, or to get some sense of, of the timing of your stuff, I think those are both good resources for a little research. Um, mm -hmm. and, and how many hours of light a day am I using, do you think is good? You're in a greenhouse, but... 
We, yeah, so we have a greenhouse and then we also have like a seedling room where we will ah. do see like when it's really cold out and we're not wanting to heat the greenhouse all the way up to the sixties when it's, you know, freezing outside. Um, we, so we do have indoor lights that we use that are led lights and have them on a timer. And so we'll have them on for 16 hours a day, which can mm-hmm. sound like a lot, but again, it's, it will just make them grow so much, so much stronger. And, um, that consistent light is really, really helpful to, to get them where you want to (laughs) go. Okay. So years ago, as I said, in the intro, you taught me some of the finer points of succession sowing outdoors in the vegetable garden, but we could kind of practice that here to have a steady supply too. Like I could imagine that if I'm getting set up, I don't want to just have one tray even if my light stand could only accommodate one at a time, I might want to have a second tray and have that starting to germinate while the uh, just before the other one is starting to be ready to heart. You know what I mean? Like staging, like moving them yeah. through. Yeah, for sure. And that way you get to, you don't have to have like a break in your microgreen supply. So you can, um, just as you said, like, you know, if you're, See if you know that it's going to take three to five days to germinate and you have one tray already under the lights, then um, you'd want to start your next tray, uh, you know, three to five days before you harvest the current one. Um, okay. And you can just sort of keep a, keep a cycle going like that. Um, and the other thing, too, is if you wanted to have, well... If you yeah, if you wanted to extend your harvest, you don't have to harvest the entire tray at one time. So this is another way you can kind of bring your trial mindset to microgreens, and you might harvest you know a third of the tray at at one stage, and then see you can find like what your favorite harvest stage is at because there can be right. a, you know a multi day window where they might still be growing and you might find that you like them a little smaller or a little bit taller. And um, in that way you can extend the harvest just from one tray by harvesting it just when you're ready to eat it. Um, Otherwise, if you do harvest it, you can keep them in a plastic bag or clamshell in the fridge and um, you'd want to eat them within a couple of days. Right. And harvesting is with a sharp scissor or uh, I love those knives, and again, both Johnny's and High Mowing sell them. It, you know, they're, it's an inexpensive knife with a serrated edge, a harvest knife. It's a great thing mm-hmm. to have for um, for cutting small things like this. But the scissor will work will work great also. So you just said um, you might like them smaller, you might like them bigger. One thing that gets a little bigger in the last couple minutes, I wanted to just talk about pea shoots because oh my goodness, what a flavor and oh just tastes like spring late spring to me so pea mm-hmm. shoots that's a little bit different right it's a little bit yeah. farther along yeah so these are um harvested they're they definitely are take up more space and um are a little hardier than the microgreens and they we typically harvest them around like four inches but just like you said they really taste like Spring, um, and you start the way you grow uh, pea shoots is just with see, the seeds from pea, uh, field peas, and um, we soak those overnight, and then we sow them very similarly to microgreens, with the exception that they are even more like the density is even higher. So we will prepare our tray of soil, and then fill the entire tray with pea shoot seeds, with pea seeds, and so you don't really even see the soil. And then we'll cover them again while they're germinating. Once they germinate, we'll take the the cover off and have them either under lights or in the greenhouse. Um, And again, if you don't have a light, you can try it on a windowsill so they get a little leggy in that (laughs) when (laughs) when they're just like leaning towards the light. But they are so delicious and um and those can really stand in as a salad on their own just because they are bigger than the microgreens um yeah 
Yeah. So, so Kate Spring from Goodhart Farmstead in Vermont. So you're an organic farm. And just in closing, I'm going to say people should use organic, certified organic, organically grown seed for all of these, I think, for everything, I mm-hmm. think, but especially for this. Um, I, I think this is, is one, like with those field peas, which are also sometimes used as a cover crop, you want to just make mm-hmm. sure this is really good and, and the best possible quality. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for making time. And now go back to your, quote, rest. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. Brushwoodnursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com. And thanks to all of you for listening. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook and on Instagram as at awaytogarden. And happy gardening and garden cleanup and growing microgreens. Meantime, Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. Robin Hood Radio.